Okay, so welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. So next talk we'll, we'll have Mike Miller talking about math programming. Uh, Mike is a very well known uh, member of the community. He has been programming Python since the last millennium. And uh, so thank you Mike and enjoy. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, microphone is, is it loud enough? OK, better now? It's supposed to be. OK, better now? Can you hear me now in the back? No? OK. Good morning, everybody. Is the mi microphone working? OK, I would like to talk about a bit metaprogramming. Uh, metaprogramming is a big topic. And I would like to talk about some use cases, what you actually can do with metaprogramming. OK, the motivation. Uh, just let me see why this doesn't show up as well as it. OK, Python offers very powerful metaprogramming techniques. Uh, the most um, uh, famous one is meta classes, but also a few other ones, decorators for functions and classes. We have discrete descriptors that can be used for this purpose. You can generate code dynamically, and you can use uh, abstract. Very, very hard to we are we are trying to raise the microphone volume from the. the okay, room. so I try to speak loudly, so people can. Okay, now it's better. So you can, so you have a lot of meta programming techniques, meta classes being the most prominent one, decorators, descriptors. You can generate code dynamically. You can you work with the abstract syntax tree, maybe a few other things. Okay, meta classes, uh, you might know this famous quote here. So if you don't know what meta classes are, don't bother. If you know what they are, then they can be very useful. That's pretty much what it says. But still, it might be interesting to know a little bit about meta classes and what they could be used for and maybe when you should not use them. And that's what I want to try to tell you a little bit about it. So what's a meta class? Uh, you can explain it in one sentence. You say that meta classes are the classes, what classes are the instances. So that's it finish the talk and you can go home. But now we want to go into a little bit more details and I want to show you how this, how this works and then what you actually could do with it, have some ideas. So when you create a class, usually you do something like this up there. You write it down in your code. You say class, give it the class a name. You inherit an object if you're in Python 2. It doesn't hurt in Python 3. And then you have some attributes in there like x is 1. You can do the same thing using type use type and this second line is exactly the same thing you see you you, you have give the name c as a string then you have a tuple with with a parent classes which is object only so a tuple with one element has a, this trailing comma and then you use a dictionary and this dictionary is the namespace so all the all the the attributes all the methods in there are just on this dictionary and that's it. So that means you can do it dynamically. So at runtime, if you feel like you can generate lots of classes without typing them into source code. Uh, and you can also have methods. So you can define methods. You see, everything is done in interactively. I just define some methods here. And then I just insert them in this dictionary. And all of you go and you have a fully working class. And there you see is a type, and this type is important because if you use type, you can actually write your own meta class. Because you always use meta class, but you want to write your own, and it's pretty easy. You just because, as I said, meta classes are the classes, what class are the instances. So you have to use the same thing, but instead of inheriting from object, you inherit from type. You see, and once you do this, you got a new meta class, and then we just override one method. There's uh, the special method str store. So the string representations if you print it out. And see, instead of the self, I get the class as a first argument. This is the same thing. The, instead of self, which is a representation for the instance, you get the class, which is a representation for the class you get later on. You don't have the class yet. 
That's why the whole thing is meta class. So it sounds a little bit intimidating sometimes, but if you just think of this analogy, it's not that difficult. So now if you do this, in, in now if I create a new class that has this new meta class, depending if I'm Python 2 or Python 3, the syntax is a bit different. So the new syntax in Python 3 is just using the keyboard argument meta class equals the new meta class, and Python 2 uses underscore version inside. So that's a bit different. But as doing essentially the same thing. So instead of inheriting from ad object, I have this meta class now. And now something happens with my class. If I uh, print, you see, instead of getting this, uh, this is class in main something, this is uh, address usually you get, uh, the, the, the ID, whatever it is. And here you get this string you generated yourself. So you change the behavior of a class. So it's very simple, and that doesn't do too much. But this is a very powerful technique. You can change the behavior of a, of a class. OK. Usually what you do uh, when you define your own meta class, you either overwrite new or init. So when you work with normal classes, most of the time you work with init. It's good enough. New is something that's called before init. And there's, a, there's some difference between new and init. Uh, if you use new with a class, uh, with, with a class that, and then you produce instances, then the first argument would be a class. And here, since you are one level higher, the first argument you see here is the MCL is a meta class. So the first argument you get in you is a meta class. Then you get the name of the class. Then this tuple with a base classes and this dictionary, which is in this case a class dictionary. So we do nothing else, just print out to see what's what's going on. And then you have to call the parent, you see. Here I use super. And this is a Python 2 syntax. So you put in the, the class itself and the meta class. So everything just one level higher. And I call the, the new uh, from there. So that's one way to do it. Sometimes you need new. There are some places you need new. But a lot of places you can get away with init. And init is a bit different. Actually, it's the same for classes. Init is a bit, so, sorry, go, go back. So now we use this meta class. You see, now either Python 2 or Python 3, we just make this one and then at definition time, since we override the new, so as soon as it types the source code in the inductive prompt, or if you import the modules and we will compile the white code, then this will happen. So that's something that happens as soon as you import the module, if you write this, this class on the module level. And that happens, and you see now it prints out uh, the meta class and the name, the name, the basis, and the dictionary. So everything we put in, we will print it out here when you do this. So this is something you, you, you change. Usually you cannot do another way because this happens as soon as this thing uh, is imported, for instance. And the init is very similar, looks very similar. The only difference here, instead of getting a meta class as a first argument, you get the class. So the class exists already because the new was called. You see the, the only the first argument has a different name. But this thing is doing ex essentially is the same. Uh, and in, as init, usually you don't have a return. You remember with a with a new, go back two slides. You had the you have the return, and this returns actually the new class you generate. And with init, you have this class already, so no return. You uh, just do something to initialize. And there's a lot of places I, I would favor the using init because uh, you don't do so much with it. You have the class already. But there are a few places like if you work with slots or something, then you use, need to use new. Okay, that's how it works how those meta classes work uh, in general. And you can do a lot of fancy things. So now if you if I make a new class, you have pretty much the same effect with in it at this place. So there's a, there's a lot more of details about it. And you, you can talk hours and have examples. But actually, the question I would, I would, also, would like also to answer is, what can, what can you do with it? You can change the behavior of a class. You can do a lot of things. You can adapt Python totally to her needs. You can do a lot, change the language, which is kind of alluring. But it's also a danger in there, because you can create something that it might be very hard to understand. You might create something that behaves differently than Python usually does. That, that's possible. And it might be difficult to understand six months later, even if, if the one who tries to understand is yourself who wrote this one. You do what, what the heck? did I do there? What is happening? That The danger might is there. And you have to be careful if you work with this meta classes, meta programming in general. So uh, what you can do with it? So it's a very powerful tool, as I said. And with great power comes great responsibility. So you should use it with care. And should 
uh, I would say you should only use it if you can find the other solution. If it's really the best solution for your purposes, if you s have all the pro and cons there and say, okay, this is really the best thing uh, to do. Use cases. Uh, I would uh, categorize use cases in two or three. Actually, it's two. One is production. You really put the meta class in production using production code. And the other one is user-facing. You give the user, you write some kind of library, you give the user an API and use meta class. And this is something you have to be very careful because if we really change the behavior of the language of how classes work, then it might be difficult uh, to use for people might not understand really what's happening. The other thing, if you use meta classes for yourself in development, and then things are different because you don't give the code out to somebody else, you deal yourself with the code. That's a different story. You can do different things. And even something goes wrong, it's not that bad because you just did the changes, then the, it's more likely that you can figure out what's happening. Unlike a user who's expecting normal Python and get something that behaves differently, that this might be maybe not the best thing. So that's the use cases I would uh, distinguish here. So one use case is frameworks. So some frameworks use meta classes, and this can be very useful. They do some magic behind. Yesterday there was or two, uh, two years ago was a uh, talk about SQL Alchemy, which using some meta class in the background to do some magic with the ORM. Some web frameworks do some magic with meta classes, and as long as you hide it very well and it's described, that that's fine. But usually you don't write a new framework every day. That's something. It's not I wouldn't call everyday use case. The other thing is you could create something like a domain specific language if you wanted to. You just whatever you, you can change Python, of course you can change the language you, to some degree, like you can limit what attributes can be stored in there. Like only certain attribute names or a method names are allowed. You just can check of course, you can check uh, um, the names of the methods. You can check only for certain patterns, and only certain patterns are allowed, or whatever. You can do a lot of things if you like to, if it makes sense. You can do operator overloading automatically and things like this. So if you want to, you can use those techniques. But then you end up with something that's not Python, or just a little bit modified Python. But it's also not something you would do every day. The use case I would like to talk a little bit more about is development tools. So what I often have, I have some code base that's not mine and it's pretty big and I don't know much about it. That would be one. You have to investigate legacy code and there meta classes can be a useful tool for a few things. Sometimes for debugging, there are interesting debugging techniques there and meta classes can be used to some degree for debugging, uh, having an advantage that you very often have to write very little code and can have a big effect on the whole code base. And also monitoring. So monitoring debugging can be similar. Sometimes you have a bug that doesn't show up in your, in your testing environment and you need to go to the real world environment and and you need to modify the code. And this meta classes, if it's done right, I think you, you can, with little effort, modify your code, then you get a lot of information what's going on and it might help you to find the bug. So it's always, and there's a lot of mites here, so it's, it does, it's not absolute. Yeah, it can be useful, but you really have to think twice. That's was my opinion. Now let's look at some code, so we can s actually see uh, an example. I try to make a simple example that makes a point, and then you you can modify the example to do a lot more things. Uh, we use it for monitoring debugging. And our cases are easy. We just want to count how many classes are actually defined in, in your code, how many classes are imported. Here, uh, that works to a certain de degree. And what we do, we, that's Python 2, we import this built-in module here. And you see, we set debug to true. So we have a switch. We'll see in a minute what it means. So if it just set debug to false, nothing happens. Your code is just bef like before. If you set it to true, then things change a bit. And the code looks like this. So inside this if debug, I define my new meta class here. And inside this meta classes, I store some information. I store all the names of this, uh, the, what I said, the, uh, yeah, names of the classes. Yeah, so we have we are one level higher. The names of the classes I want there, and also a count. A count how many classes are are actually defined. That's something you don't 
you get you put it in your code, that will be done. At compile time, you don't have to use any external tools. That's done by Python itself as soon as this meta class. And you see, I use the init here because it's enough. I don't need to use the new. So remember, the init takes the class as the first argument, the name of the class, the basis, and the dictionary of the class. And then uh, the count is zero. The first time I don't... Um, do anything special uh, because the first time we will see a minute why it is like this. So the first time I just increment the counter. So if only the counter is zero, so this one will be false. The first time, the first time this init is called, I just increment the counter. So I have one instance, no, one class actually, not the instance, a class. And then the second time I do something and I only append the name. Here, this class has a module and a name. And I just have a qualified name of the module dot class, and I just append it to the list. That's all. And I print something out. So you see something. I print out the counter, and I print out the name. So you see something that something happens. That's all. So this is very simple, just to make the point. But here you can insert uh, way more uh, uh, complex things if you like to. Okay, that's a uh, that's in it. Remember this one, and then how we use it. Uh, I just uh, since I don't want to write this new meta class all the time, I just generate a new base class, and this is a new object which has this meta class in Python two manner here, and I do something you should think twice. I replace the built-in object. So the built-in build object. Remember, that's for debugging. That's not for reduction. The built-in object. I replace the built-in object, and with this my new object. Uh, it's not too bad here because I don't do much. I just extract information and print them out. I don't change the behavior of things, which you could do, but that's something that can be dangerous. So, and this is, I change this object, and now everything I do, as soon as a, if I create a new style class in Python 2 or normal class in, uh, in Python 3, I will get. I will get a different behavior. So I, here so I define three classes. Two classes inherit from object, and one class does not. And since I change the built-in object, I will see different behavior. See, that's a definition time. So I don't execute anything, so to speak. I just import or uh, run this without making instances of it. And then you see this output. You see, as soon as you do this, you see this output. And uh, you see, the, I print out the counter, and I print out the list with the names I generated. You see, the first two classes, some class 1 and some class 2, are on the list. The third one is not, because I don't inherit from object. Yeah, so that's the difference. So if you inherit from object, then I change the behavior globally. And if I have a gigantic code base with a lot of classes, I would see all the classes that actually compiled at this time. So if you define a class somewhere on a function, the function never gets called. You won't see it. But everything that's actually uh, compiled to bytecode here will end up because this init is called, because a class is created. And you see how many classes are there. So if you do it in Python 3, it's, it's nearly uh, the same. But now, uh, how I use it? Uh, so I have two different versions. One is for Python uh, 2 and Python 3 because of a bit syntax. I just import one of them. And then, uh, as soon as they import them, they, they override this built-in object. So it's a, it's a side effect I don't see here, actually. So it, it can be a bit dangerous, but it's, it's for debugging, so you know what you're doing. You don't give it out for users. You use, use yourself. And the time you do this and the time you look at the result is very close. It's nothing that there's a lot of time between, you know, what to expect. And then we have this, this class called maybe debug. And depending if I set a switch of debug true or false, remember we had the everything in this switch, so we can even turn everything off. Debug is true if I set it to false, nothing happens. Everything is untouched. If I set it to true, magic will happen. So, and then this magic, fortunately, is only extract information, it doesn't change the state, it doesn't do anything with our class here. And then we have this information, and you see how many classes are defined. So that's maybe debug. And if you do the same thing with Python 3, uh, Python 3, a few things change. The built-ins with underscores change. This is built-ins here with unders underscores, and how you write the meta class is a bit different. So Python 3 is a, a few small uh, differences here, and many, many syntax-wise. Okay, so that's an example of what you can do with meta classes, and this is a very simple recipe, but you can extend it to a lot of different things. You can do many more things uh, 
what, what, uh, here I counted how many classes are defined. You could also go in and check for methods, how many methods are called, what's happening, how often methods are called. Without going to, end, to all the classes separately, you only go to the one uh, that's defining object and you find a new object and all the classes will do the same thing and they will log all this information. And no matter if it's 10 classes or 100 classes, that will work and you do it only once. You could measure runtime, so you could use other tools uh, to measure how how long things runs run, and also you can also be very selective. You can only r measure separate several methods. Of course, you have the method names. You could check at them and just check by patterns. You could extend logging to some degree to log whatever you want to log. Though, of course, in, in, in addition to meta class, you can use other techniques. I showed decorators and things like this if you like to. But a lot of things you can do uh, in there. You could that you could automatically decorate. Uh, methods uh, in, in, in it because you just go to the dictionary, with a class dictionary, do things in there. And you could also like trigger sending emails to admins or a lot of different things you can do and this can be very powerful and I think as long as you use it only for debugging uh, that, that's, a, that's a good good thing. Okay, again, as I showed this works only for new style classes so if you don't inherit from object it doesn't it doesn't work. If somebody has a class that doesn't inherit from object you're out of luck and that might happen. So it's not 100% but it might uh, might work. And I, my opinion is as long as it just extract information and just show things it's safe. As soon as you start changing the state you change your system. So if you get into the class and insert something that actually changes the adding methods on the fly which you could or other things then it's getting a bit more dangerous. Uh, so that's maybe something you don't want to do. And also there's what's a thing called class method, uh, class decorators and class decorators can do quite a few tasks. You can yeah, usually you used to do with meta classes and but class decorators can few, do a few things but this one you would need to decorate all the classes and with a meta class approach as we have seen you have to do it only once and you can override this object uh, for your purposes. Okay, so my recommendations are uh, you should use meta programming only if, if it's the best thing, and, and only if there's no other solution. Um, don't use meta class because they are fun. As, 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 as long as it's fun, if object is a uh, project is fine. But in for other things, just because they are so nice, just try to use them all over the place. That's probably not a good way to do it. Uh, and try to avoid it in code or release unless it's it's a framework that really can profit from this one. And still try to make your code behave as Pythonic as possible. Because since you can change the behavior of the language, uh, you might create something that's unexpected. So unexpected code behavior, it's not nice. So no surprises. If you surprise a user, that's some, some, something. So if you, if you debug something and you surprise yourself, that might, might be OK. But if you surprise other people, uh, it might, might make it difficult to use. So, the rule of thumb is use meta programming for meta tasks and getting information about your code, how many classes are defined, how many methods are called are meta tasks. And I think for this meta programming is, is very well suited and you can save you a lot of work and other things you would not dare. So you, you wouldn't go in and just change 100 classes. But if you just write one meta class and all 100 classes get it automatically, that's, that's maybe doable and you get some information uh, about the code. So everything boils down uh, using the right tool for the right purpose. Okay, thank you very much and hopefully you have some questions. Hi. Uh, so Okay, so uh, I'm not sure your example would work if you have other meta classes in your project because then they wouldn't inherit from the same. So yeah, I like because object is base for every classes, and if they have another meta class that doesn't yes. inherit from your meta class, that would break. Yeah. Since you're mon monkey patching the uh, the built-in object, so could you monkey patch the built-in type 
instead. I'm not sure that would work, so that's why I'm I, asking. I don't know. I have never tried. That would be meta-meta programming. I don't know if, if this is a good thing to do. I have I never tried. I said you have to, you, it, it, that's that's the thing. The only, only if, if this thing, the, the classes that inherit from object, or the others are out. And if they have a different meta class, they don't inherit from object. You would have runtime exceptions if there are other meta classes because yeah. your classes would have would have meta classes that don't inherit from each other, which is not possible. In yeah, so there, there's always something. So this is if you have a. A normal code base, people don't use other meta classes. So if you have a framework that uses meta class itself, it might might not work. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Question for you and me before the audience: Things like Google protocol buffers and similar techniques, they're generating code quite heavily. Uh, maybe you know, or somebody else knows why, instead of like we can have init.py with three lines of code. And now we have hundreds of lines of generated code, which doesn't help the person to read it, because it's unreadable. Yeah, that, that, that's a danger, because now the very powerful technique, and with these few lines, you can generate as much code as you like. You can generate, as I see, in, in a loop, you can gen generate hundreds of classes, if you like to, no problem. But the problem, who's, how are you going to debug the thing? That's, that's how you understand if something. As, as long as it works, fine. As soon as something goes wrong, you have a problem. But it still doesn't help. S that code generated still doesn't help. I mean, I, I looked at it. It's, it's pretty, it, it, it really, it's internal to protocol buffers. So there is may, maybe somebody wants here to shout out, that yes, this is good for protocol buffers. Why? No, nobody? Okay, so I'll still be annoyed. Thank you. Um, in the example of the type in you, you, you have the meta class as the first argument, so the class has not been created yet. Could we use that instead of a prepare to change the class dictionary to be an ordered dictionary, for example? Which one do you mean? You mean the new, overriding new? Um, so using a new to change the class container to be an order dictionary instead of using dunder prepare dunder. I never tried this. I don't know. Also, uh, it, it, I don't. Why, why do you want to do this? What what what, what does it help if it's ordered? Uh, if you wanted to have an ordered attributes of a class. Yeah, if it's just a dictionary, and if if the order dict has all the same method as a dictionary, I don't see why it shouldn't work. But I, I have to try, I don't know. But if, if all the methods are there, because it's a dictionary, you, you, you in Python usually don't check for the, for the type, you just ask, can you do this? And if this auto dictionary can do the same thing as a dictionary, it should work, but I, I haven't tried, so I don't know. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I think, uh, one possibility for uh, what uh, the last question was asking, maybe instead of just returning what you got from uh, the super call, you can just get and inspect before returning. So you can do the normal processing first, then when you get the class and you do whatever you want to do with the class, before returning the class to the, uh, to the module that uh, will be stored and, uh, and everything. So you can either do something before or even after the standard processing. I, is this? Sorry? Yes, this is something that is probably, there, there are a few tricks to do this uh, that is used in, uh, I think, some uh, web uh, framework. But this is one of the problems. I think there is a proposal for using an order addict for the, uh, for the classes. If I remember correctly, there is something like that in Python that. I remember reading something about this, okay? Y yes, to, to answer the, this precise question, I think that in Python 2.7 you can have an under under prepare method on the meta class which returns the dictionary which will be used to store the attributes of the class. So if you, if you override under under prepare in my meta and you return another dictionary, then the, this, uh, this dictionary will, will store the keys, the attributes in order, and then the cdict in the example 
will have the attributes in the same order as the user declared. I think this was the, the question. Welcome. Um, I was thinking maybe it could be useful to do some uh, kind of check of convention in a project. If I, if I, I don't want camel case methods, if I don't want similar things, but is there a penalty, performance penalty by doing these things in general or? Uh, not, not a lot, because yeah. this happens as, as, I, as I do now only when you, when you import the module, when you get it compiled. And that's the only time, that, and then it's after the run, it, it's, it's done. Yeah. Actually, it, it's a good example because I have a, in, in, in my course, I have exactly these examples. You check that the method names are not longer than 30 characters, mm -hmm. that, that all methods have doc strings that have more than five uh, characters that, and things like this. So you can do this. So what PyLint is doing, you can do dynamically to, this, to some degree to check all, all, your, to all those conventions, the so naming, doc strings, whatever you want, a number of, of methods and things like this. I, I haven't seen any project that does that, but I suppose it could be nice. Yeah, I think that that's a good use because if you use it only before you deploy, just internally, uh, that's, that's fine. So I think, and that's, I think that there shouldn't be a lot of penalty performance-wise. It's just if you, if you do this, you, 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 don't, you, you don't feel anything that's going on. I haven't measured yet, but uh, I don't think it has any, any uh, implication, practical implication. Yeah, thanks a lot. If you have an application with, uh, let's say, a dozen of mod modules and you want to to run some metrics, uh, how many methods are called, by whom. Uh, um, do you need to do to do this for uh, for every module in that application, or uh, it will be accessible if you do it no. just once? The, the way I do it, you see, I I, I write the built-in. So build as long as you don't don't define your own object in a module and. Python will find this one, which you shouldn't do. So if you find the built-in object and you overwrote it, I inject it here. Uh, that's that's where the trick is. You see, this this line here, I, I, I this is a built-in object and I put it in the every you know, the whole project gets it. So you okay. so but also all the other libraries also everything you're using will get it. So as soon as you do this, everything will get this new. But if you want to be consistent, you should do this very first because some them otherwise. Some classes will get the old one, and yeah. some classes will get the new one, and that's probably not what you want. So but you if want. If I put it in my main, it will be okay. My main module. Yeah, if you do that, with the very first thing you do, then it should be before doing imports. Then it should be should work. So it's always should because sometimes you're surprised there there might be some interaction with some with a lot of things. So it's difficult if you have big projects. There might be some unexpected interactions. So I had had this, and then you have to go to discover. So for for the, for a lot of things that works, but there might be a few things as that other meta class things. Then okay. it just breaks down. That that yeah, there's no guarantee. Okay, thanks. Well, if you want to be well known, you can do this in your own module and release it as a third party module and people will know you. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, is there any possible to defer the class load? So if I ever want to manage the order of in uh, class initialization, um, is there any uh, trick? I mean, if if uh, I have three classes and they are, um, you know, uh, they are declared in this order A, B, C, and if I uh, want somehow program programmatically change the order of initialization or defer uh, class B to be initialized after the class the class C, can I do this somehow? I just will make three modules, import them in order. I don't, I don't know. This would be the easiest, likely. Um, I mean, pro programmatically, not the, you know, changing without changing the code uh, of the declaration. The Python works line by line. It goes through line by line and compiles it. I don't think you can. Um, no, I don't know. I don't think it's possible. Um, going back to your to that same slide. Um, if I'm not being mistaken, if I, f if I have a framework that uses uh, it, the meta classes, means that I won't be monitoring these. My, I, I don't understand the question. Which which if, which I, if I have a framework which uses meta classes in its own classes, I won't be m monitoring these. 
I haven't tried this, this, this out yet. So then you could simply overwrite type instead of overwriting the meta class of objects, in which case I would s scope these as well. I don't know. I, I would need to try. I, I don't know. I have, I've never tried to overwrite type, so I, I'm I'm pretty pretty happy with overwriting, <laughs> overwriting generating of classes, but overwriting type and do something. Yeah, I have to think through. But there's a lot of details. So if you have a, something like this, uh, it can take you a day or two to, to experiment and try different things. Yeah, you know, that can be can be pretty pretty tricky. Also, if you have Decorators like static and class method they are pretty different because the, the, so there, there's, there might be some things. So if you use a few other things, there might might be some unexpected things. They're all explainable, but it takes a while to find the reason for those things. Okay, so just that we have time, and people say that now Python is getting a little bit uh, uh, mainstream language, sort of but we still have a hack, hacking so. Uh, I have a question for both Mike and all the, all the attendees. Uh, what do you think would be like the, the more evil um, usage of meta class you can think about it? <laughs> I think there's, there's no limit to evenness here, so you can do quite a fair, uh, yeah, the, the you don't need meta in Python two. You say true comma false equals false comma true, and that's evil enough, I would say. And then put it in built-ins, and then you break everything. They don't need meta programming for this one. So in Python three, fortunately, it does not work. But that's uh, that's very often I show people don't do this, and it's just never never execute it. For just type it in and, and delete it. That would be one of the things that it would screw up every program easily. About being evil, and <laughs> I could think of something that m someone might think it's a good idea, and I would <laughs> like to to say this. Not you could write a meta class which automatically uh, catch all exceptions from for uh, from the methods, and they log them and they g uh, ignore the exception. <laughs> yeah, but it, don't, don't do it, please. It, it, you don't need meta class. I used once. I had a student. He wrote, try main accept pass. <laughs> so, and everything runs through and that's, that's it. <laughs> Maybe you could do a rickrolling meta class. Each time you instantiate or create a new class, it uh, redirects you to the YouTube video of uh, Rick Astley. <laughs> But you s you have to, to do some tricky redirections, uh, Io. Of course, if you want to be really tricky, you can uh, change the bytecode of the methods of the class. And I think it would be possible to switch true and false even in Python 3 that way. It, yeah, of course, as, as soon as you leave uh, p playing Python and go to bytecode, or you see types, you can do anything. Yeah. So in C types, there's an example, C types 2 equals 3, true, because somebody messed with C types and changed things. That's that's possible. As soon as you dive into C, you can change anything in Python. Okay, so trying to be good now. And what do you think we we could do, like language to to be the uh, ideal world meta class uh, pattern? I mean, the thing there is there's something that we can do to make it make them. I don't mean easier, but safer and so on. It's difficult. So if if you really want to do powerful things, then then it's not safe. So if the only thing you can do if you want to be safe, just don't use it. That's it. That, that's 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 the only thing. If you really want to do something powerful and something some introspection kind of thing like this, then there's always a the danger of something goes wrong. So and some as long as it just blows on your face, it's fine. But if it goes wrong, you don't don't see it. That that's a that's a worst case. Yeah, I think I don't have a good solution to it because there's there's still sometimes things you're surprised, and then takes you a long time to figure out why it happens. But eventually, everything is it's it's logical. Yeah, so I think it always uh, you always uh, you have to keep your common sense. There are a lot of patterns, a lot of things how to do it. By the end of the day, you still think through: is this the right thing? And take a step back and and try to get a perspective from above. And just 
if you can solve without meta program, solve without meta program. That's it. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much, Mike. And we'll be